lecture was giving a background of the empirical modeling, specifically the kernel regression. Here we're going to uh, show actually how, how being implemented with uh, in the facial reproduction uh, software. Um, in, in this case, we use um, 100 data set CTs uh, uh, in this study. So again, the outline would be introduction, a little bit of history, problem definition, the methods used. <laughs> Uh, the results and then the conclusion and what is the future work. Um, nearly all facial uh, reproduction techniques rely on the average tissue thickness in the tables produced from past studies. The average tissue thickness are measured at 21 traditional craniometrical landmarks on the cranium and mandible. Uh, these are the well-known uh, landmarks, uh, the 21 landmarks and uh, Traditionally, locations use the fiducial landmark uh, used, okay? The 21 traditional uh, locations used on the reconstruct skulls are actually a total of 32 fiducial uh, markers because 11 of the anatomical locations are used on each side of the skull. There are no studies of the statistical analysis of the relationship between facial and cranial landmarks, and in particular, the correlation between bone and soft tissue landmarks around the eye, orbits, nose, mouth, and ears. This is uh, uh, from the citation. So um, we have not seen a lot of uh, correlation studies of the soft uh, tissue um, values compared to the landmarks. So this is a quote from one publication discussing the issues of current facial approximation methods. The intricacy and complexity of the soft tissues overlaying the skull is significant. And to be able to predict them accurately and precisely from the skull alone would definitely be something special. I mean, the code's clear. It's uh, complexity of soft tissues, basically. It's not being studied enough yet with the landmarks. So the purpose of the study examined the possible correlations between bony structure and the cranium and soft tissue uh, that surrounds it. Con construct an empirical model based on the correlations to predict the facial tissue depth for 21 landmark locations. Uh, the non-parametric modeling, uh, we basically uses past event data, memory matrix to understand future predictions. No training time, as I said before, here we cannot, we don't have enough data even to create training data sets, so no training times, easily updated with additional data like some sort of plug and play. If you look at this kernel regression, it's like a plug and play uh, software, you just add it and it works. Three different kernel regression architectures we studied. So the non-parametric uh, model, this, uh, we use the inferential model, which I explained in the last lecture. We have one input, uh, multiple input, one output, with the heteroassociative models, which multiple inputs, multiple outputs, and, uh, uh, and the auto-associative uh, model. Again, uh, um, this is the same uh, diagram, and we're going to go explain it a little bit in detail. So you have... Uh, the input will explain the input exemplars and the output exemplars from the data, and the kernel function, and then the weighted average, and then the predicted uh, output. That's the basic model. Uh, the distance that we use, the Euclidean distance, uh, which is basically uh, the distance between uh, two different points, the kernel that's being used was a Gaussian kernel, so you use the Euclidean distance in the function, that's basically D, and then the bandwidth is H, and then this is the prediction, the output, the prediction uh, uh, output. And uh, uh, the model, uh, say Gaussian uh, kernel, varying bandwidth, the H, here in this study was the optimal results around 2.6, and optimized to reduce the mean square error of predictions. Uh, the methods, we, had the <coughs> we did CT image collection of 100 male subjects, uh, C data was collected in the PET CT imaging department of Thompson Cancer uh, Survival Center, West Knoxville. And uh, what we did, uh, only those with uh, uh, PET CT scans labeled as melanoma, bone and brain were examined as possible subjects to use in the study because their scan procedures should have included the complete cranium and mandible. There are a number of procedures that what we could not use, like when you look at ENT, they only take the uh, partial uh, skull, and we could not use these ones. Th this happened that, uh, in this case, 
the scan was for the complete skull. So the process was we did image processing and then segmentation and then registration with a template skull. Talk, we'll talk about it later, but template skull in a nutshell is, is uh, from anthropology. They, put, uh, they had a skull where they put the markers like the way they do in the reconstruction, and then we scan this uh, with the markers. And then the measurements and then add to database. Um, loading CT image, uh, there was a problem, and as was talking in uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the early lec uh, my lecture, uh, was the problems that come with CT. There were a number of problems, of course, with the CT and uh, uh, some of the non-uniform sampling. Uh, since they do the entire skull, sometimes they don't, they use three millimeter slices, so there were some gaps, and this can affect when you segment the bone. So we had to do enhancement and 3D segmentation. Uh, uniform sampling used when slices are not equally spaced or there is a large gap between each slice. In this case, to minimize the radiation, they were using a little bit uh, large gap. Uh, and uh, if we do uniform uh, resampling, basically stacks the images in the volume data, re-slice the volume with equidistance planes, fill the gaps between each slice using interpolation. And the output volume has a better resolution and can be segmented easily. Uh, interpolation is basically if you want to interpolate the value of the PP5VUs, the numbers, and uh, there are different types of interpolation. Uh, there's nearest neighbor, linear, bilinear, cubic, and uh, uh, so here an example. Before sampling, this is a sagittal view. As you can see, it's very difficult to work with uh, someone even knowledgeable of the anatomy would sit down and some of the uh, structures. Uh, in this study, they were not interested in internal structures, but we are interested in other studies with internal structure. So it, it was important to find a way uh, uh, to get over this problem. So, uh, and the segmentation came, of course, a stack. We use uh, DICOM uh, to create the 3D surface model. So uh, we had to extract bone contours from each CT slice to construct a surface. Uh, the data window, as uh, was, uh, we used here and here, the subjectivity come a little bit, was 150 to 255. And uh, uh, there were some scattering problems because people, there was some, some cases that they have dental implants, did some scatter in the image. Uh, and the smoothing, uh, the, the skull is, uh, Karenia is not uh, an easy, uh, uh, um, we had 100,000 faces. i give you an example, usually in the femur, for example, if you have 7,000. That, that's an example of tell you, because of the complexity of, of, of the skull, you have more faces. A procedure developed for consistent segmenting all of the 100 patients. And we'll allow for surface registration. So what is the surface registration? So we wanted to take this uh, template, the model after the CT scan, and we superimpose it on every carinia in order to identify the landmarks. And of course, the methods that I explained yesterday, which include the, the registration, transformation, affine transformation, and the idea said like the template, like when you have a template and you basically want to stretch it on the scalp, it's basically used here. And that's how we use it to, to align the markers that use in the template skull over every case. So that's a template skull. So this is the one that was used, it was a, a not from the 100 cases, this was a skull from anthropology. They came and the artist put the markers and we took the skull and we CT the skull with the markers locations. So the 3D uh, to 3D registration was taking the model scaling, we do the rigid alignment, uh, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, iterative closest point, and then the affine registration, which basically, uh, um, take the two models, align them together rigidly, and then allow some flexibility uh, for, for the different skulls to come close to each, uh, each other. And then you do the relaxation, which realign the, tem the template skull over the, uh, with preserving the anatomical structures. Uh, the iterative mathematically, basically, uh, uh, it is uh, use closest point pair on different meshes. So you have a mesh from the template and, um, and your mesh from the case, the pay, uh, subject and you want to minimize the distance between them, so it, it goes through a, a program to compute least squares, transformation, and find the best alignment. 
And of course, through doing this, this is, you have, I said, 100,000 polygons or faces, <coughs> the number of points large. So this process, uh, if it's not done efficiently, can, can take a long time. So we, we developed our software, OCTREE-based ICP, which basically reduced the complexity, uh, reduced this process from, if you do a brute fo force method, which try to align every point to every point, can take the time, as you can see, can go this time in second. Uh, the OCK3 here is ba basically very fast uh, because it, it, it uh, divides uh, the space using OCK3 representation. Now, before alignment here are, this is the subject on the right and the template on the left. And basically, after alignment, this is how they look. Uh, this, this part in the alignment, this is rigid alignment. Then you want to do, still they are not the same because two different people. So you have to use what's called a fine registration which does translation, rotation, and shear, which basically uh, it's used also in the uh, procrusty. But, uh, ag and, and again, when you align them together, you want to make sure that they are in the same space, and then basically to allow the relaxation step. And doing this, use OCK3, find the closest point between new skull and base skull. So this is before affine, this is after affine registration. And then the relaxation, a final registration is a rigid, apply some transformation on all model points. Relax relaxation is a free form deformation where each point on the base skull is allowed to move freely to the nearest point on the new skull. That's how we come very close to uh, the two models. And then this is before relaxation, this is after relaxation. You can see now it's very precise on the specific, uh, in this case, patient, because they were live patients. So uh, the 3D to 3D registration, uh, this is uh, our software. We built this software for this uh, project uh, to make sure that we could uh, we be able to uh, um, use this fiducial markers and then use it in soft tissue uh, estimation. That's after registration. So the, um, the register-based model uh, and the new model in the, we call it intelligent uh, modeling framework. So. Tissue and bone thickness measurements. Uh, so we did it one skull at a time, picked 30, 40 points at desired craniometrical location. Tissue and bone thickness measured for each point select. Uh, I want to say something. We use these points because this is what the points used by the community. But in this software, there is nothing prevent you from picking any point you want. But in this case, you don't have data to match. So if we decide to pick points that is not in the tables. We don't know whether it's correct or not. We have to do some more studies. So we wanted to make sure that we are comparing to uh, published data before. So the 13 landmarks used for bone thickness measurements, limitation due to database body mass in index and age. Of course, if we have uh, missing information. Uh, useful landmarks mainly along the midline of the skull and forehead. Uh, the reason is um, uh, some of the patients were older patients and uh, uh, sagging uh, uh, from age and was some problem. So we didn't use all of them. We used the ones that we know that uh, may not uh, affect uh, the measurements. And also uh, uh, obesity was uh, very problem because most of the dat data for this, this is older, older population. So we have uh, li really large people. You can see here the average BMI was uh, 29. That's, that's huge. Uh, but was benefit also because we could uh, compare. Uh, uh, the other thing, I mean, may, well, someone may, may suggest what you have to compare to younger population, but that's the population we had. Uh, this is the list of the landmarks used for uh, uh, superglabella, glabella, and is all, all of them, you're probably very well aware of them. These are the 13 measurements. Uh, so uh, this is the five selected measurements and conducted on se segmented surface models like, like this is uh, the Bayesian, Prosethean, uh, Bayesian, Nasian. They, they, these are the kind of other measurements, orbit height, uh, nasal uh, breadth, uh, and same. I mean, this is the five. Now, the input to the kernel regression here are, uh, we have. <laughs> 100 obser observations, because we have 100 patients. We have 22 variables. Here, the 13 bone thickness measurements. And then the other five ethnicity determination me measurements. 
<laughs> again, five demographics, age, uh, weight, height, and then the, the BMI. And then the output memory matters the 13 uh, facial tissue thickness, okay? So if you look back again, uh, this is the model, this is Hakkar model we used. So these are from uh, 100, the vertical 100 cases, and the 22 parameters on, so it's 100 by 22. And you have the query input, the, the, the 13 uh, that we used, and then the weights, and then basically you have uh, the outputs, which is basically the 13 measurements, the outputs predicted in the case. In the case of the inferential model, because we use three models, uh, we have one output for each. So you have, for example, in every time you do the 13, uh, 13, 13 times, because it will, it will bring one output at a time rather than the multiple input, like all of them at the same time. Uh, and that's the correlation analysis. So anything absolute values of 0.3 or greater were useful. Very high, we found that very high correlations in the weight and BMI uh, predictor. So predictor 20 and 22. And this is the correlation matrix for all of them. And you can see uh, some of the uh, measurements. But most of the correlation came in the uh, weight and height. Now, this is uh, some leave, one, uh, leave out one uh, uh, method, which is basically uh, from the data set. You, pick, you take one of the 100. And then you run the correlation, and then you see if you can predict. So sometimes, uh, some people call it also jackknife uh, type of test. So here, as you can see, the, here the predictions using the hetero associate uh, hacker model. You can see the actu actual tissue thickness and then the predicted uh, tissue thickness. Um, now, that's the results compared to average performance uh, matrix for all hacker models. Uh, models using demographic predictors. Here, we added the, the demographic predictors, and then the table is comparing the root mean square. If you look at the table, that's from the table standard table. So it's, you have a 3.07 millimeter error. Our prediction was 2.04 millimeter error. Now, if you include uh, 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 that's including the demographic predictors. You move the demographic predictors. Uh, 2.21 millimeter versus 3.07 millimeter. So um, again, the inf inferential um, kernel regression model uh, usually provides more accurate predictions. And as you can see uh, also here, the, the values are much better. But here, because again, the output is one at a time. So you can see that uh, in this case, the output is 1.89 millimeter. Uh, much better than the, the table uh, root mean square error. And then uh, if you remove the predictor, still did good, good result. Now, if you look at uh, this is uh, left, uh, that's what the artist or forensic expert did without knowing anything about this software. Okay, this is the person. And after we modified the soft tissue, that's the rendering on the right. So in this case, uh, uh, let's see the other case. The other case was more significant here because if you look at uh, the artist, and this is, the, this is the, uh, the subject that passed away. This is the picture when it came to the donated c collection. You can see that this is, uh, in my own opinion, I mean, if uh, you tell me, the one on the left, a little bit far away from the I mean, you can't tell the same person. At least here we captured some of the thickness. I mean, that's the scenarios I'm talking about. So if, if you're confused and you want to apply this, and I hope it applied one day, that basically you, you, you create multiple scenarios. So you, you can, if, if you have some form, uh, maybe someone in mind that this person, the person was thin or fat, or you can, you can change the body mass index, and then you can have another rendering maybe compare two rendering. So this one was, I think, in my own opinion, was the best rendering at all. The, the one on the left, I don't think represent the person at all. So the skull was presented to the uh, forensic expert. Mm -hmm. She created the model. You compare to the picture, that's completely different. Now, after the work was done again, uh, including uh, the body mass index and the, uh, and the other information, 
this more is more realistic or more closer actually to, to the subject. So conclusion, the methodology and procedures required to collect and analyze the cranial data were developed. Dakar model and inferential model built with 100 observations, both yielded results with less error than the currently used uh, table tissue thickness. The demographics, weight, and body mass index are the highest correlated predictors for tissue thickness among 22 predictors used in this pilot study. Demographics, especially weight and body mass index, are usually not provided to the forensic arts. But uh, technologies could be used to help estimate them from skeletal remains. Uh, the three-dimensional clay reconstruction resulted in noticeable improvements when using the developed model compared to the currently used normal tissue thickness tables. Uh, and this is some of the cited reference, but I want to say future. What we would like to do is to apply the methods to more complete data sets. We, we did another proposal where we can get uh, younger population, so we can have another example. The original data consists of 100 males who were predominantly older and overweight. Um, we would like to use, uh, ma make use of the automatic feature extraction system that can be used to more exhaustively search for good predictors of skin thickness. Optimize the kernel-based model, uh, which may also involve generating separate models using demographic information. And then generation of uh, automated surface rendering using skin thickness atlases. Uh, this is an example of the software showing the, the process here. So here, as you can see, the, the CT data set. And that, that's our software, we developed this software. This is the windows that I explained earlier. Uh, this is the two values were the window level and window width. Is there any way we can <coughs> appear in the, we keep seeing something, what do those say? I just uh, th these are the intensity level, window level, the, the parameters that I was, okay. so you manipulate them and you get the, to get the right threshold for, for segmenting the, the bone. And this is the render, the visualization portion, which actually, uh, you, you can see completely the, the face of the person here, um, if you do pr properly ask. Um, are you That you yes, one you can. We can have both. You can, you can, you can work it as a scenario where you can change the body mass index and, and look at the outputs for these values, and can have multiple scenarios. And uh, uh, but doing this, there's two ways of doing this. Is you get the the the, the 13 in this case, uh, we use uh, predictions, or you run it for every one of them separate. So you run 13 times. That's the inferential. But you take these values and you, you can make any multiple runs. They can make multiple runs. And if you are confused, you don't know anything and you want to have maybe three or four different rendering for, for, uh, for this case, you, you could do that certainly. Mm -hmm. But if you have a little bit, you don't know anything. Yeah, you can get light and heavy. <laughs> or if you have some information of a missing person that was big person or small, then that basically makes you narrow down on 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 uh, um, on this, uh, <coughs> so y you make a scenario for for use a body mass index, f the real body mass index for this person makes the rendering, makes the the production of the of this model uh, close to accurate. That's the whole idea here. So it's not only giving you you have to rely on tables. Now the good thing about this work is the more you do studies like that. If we can have, uh, we we're planning to have this like a public model. You add to it. The more you add to to add to it data, the more the regression and the kernel, I mean, the more <coughs> our prediction comes closer and closer. They put multiple ethnicity, you put different ages. But stuff like that takes years to have a full, it took you 10 years. It takes something like that to act. The difficulty, the difficulty here is, is when we get, we get this from older patients. Now, how to recruit, uh, how to recruit younger uh, subjects and then say I'm gonna uh, CT your entire skull then you have maybe to use MRI other things so that's what uh, that we're trying to to have other uh, studies that we could include 
another kind of, uh, I mean, different uh, uh, population. Now comes, no, no, I no, I was saying the complexity here, if now you're looking at uh, different ancestral, uh, black, uh, white, uh, uh, Hispanic, uh, but again, uh, I think was refining the model to accommodate different uh, <laughs> ancestral, uh, ancestral uh, uh, input, uh, we could have one model that can accommodate different. That's what I'm hoping for. Go ahead. Um, I had a question about, you said the BMI is correlated to each of those measurements that you said? Yes. Yeah. Um, and those are the ones, I, I'm, as the, I understood, along, along the midline, they don't really change with obesity or age? No, I mean, in, in from our data set, it was so, some of them we had because we had some patients was uh, was sagging. I mean, when, when even the patient on the CT, because the gravity uh, will, will push the skin. So these were taken as uh, kind of uh, that it's easier in our work. The, the variation with them was not from from subject to subject was large, uh, but I, I, there is nothing preventing from using the other ones. But what was there a correlation between? Because I mean, BMI is a measure of okay. correlation of of predicting the so, the soft tissue. Oh, okay. So the correlation saying if you use the BMI, uh, our our prediction is better of the soft tissue. So mm -hmm. if you remove the demographics, you 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 get good results, but better than the tables. But it's, it's not what you expect because you're completely blind. You don't know anything about the, the subject. But you still, we still we scored better results than the uh, tables that were done. I can't remember the table were, were, were done. There's, uh, I used to remember uh, what kind of population. It was mainly white population, I assume. The tables were, were uh, that's being used. Um, so. The point here is that our prediction, even without the demographics, were better than the tables. But you include the demographics becomes more refined. Okay. Other questions? The, the original tables that they were using, I mean, for all we know, they were using army recruits. Or oh, that's another point, the younger people. Yeah. Younger yeah. People. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do the standard artists use at least age determined by the anthropology <coughs> exam? I, I don't know that they use age. I, I, all what I know that they use the soft tissue table, they didn't use age into the process, at least in this study. Just the standardized. Yeah. Yeah. Generally, they do. The artists will work with the anthropologists, and we will do ancestry, age. We will supply all that information to the artists. That's how it works here. Okay. Um, so I, I think the artist did the same thing, but, but was presented with the skull, was presented with the skull, and uh, uh, probably little information, because this is a kind of blind study for the artist here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering if perhaps their work review is more set on you know, what hair color and style. And yeah, that's where you get like the artist and almond hair color, that's all kind of... Subject. That's art. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, there are two things. This is this is excellent question, because I want to distinguish between the pictures, which you're rendering for the pictures. I said rendering number of times. I meant rendering of uh, physical and the clay. So they do the, in, in, the, in the pictures, they can include whatever they want. It's a picture at the end. In the, um, it's very difficult, uh, in, I think, in the clay. They can get some idea about the age, but not a lot. And, and, and then um, the other thing, the hair color and the eyes, I think this is done even with the clay completely uh, for, for the artist or for the forensic expert, it's, it's, it's not based on, on science, really. I mean, there's no way. But at least the soft tissue part, we, we, can, we can get some scientific input into it. Have you used any of this, um, like, charred remains for, like, reconstructing the you know, burn bodies, you know? That's a good could, could be, but no, I haven't. I, I, uh, no, but it's I think would be very, very nice. Yeah, very useful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, at th this point, when we did the work, we were really wanted to see if the kernel regression is the right one versus neural network versus all this. That's why we exclude. We have a huge 
background of neural network. My lab is machine vision, machine learning lab. So we, we, we know how this is like second to our nature and we don't even use it in MATLAB. We're all the C++, we write the code for this. So we wanted to make sure that uh, training, there was no training here. I mean, there's basically, there was this 100 data sets, how you train it and then how you train it and then where you get uh, a new case to test on. So we build the mathematics and we test it with the cases we have and leave one out, which basically tested the 100 cases. Yeah. So we take 100 times. Mm. Mm. <coughs> Questions in mind? So to, to get more into your database, um, how would we get that information to you? Would we, so let's say, would we send you the skull? I think the deployment, in my own opinion, is to use the software. Uh, you do take the skull, you CT the skull, and, and, import and import it, and you do it yourself. You don't have to get it to us. So the, the whole idea when you, this is transition of a technology, that it op opens this to people to use it, uh, not us uh, have control. But if to have a little bit more uh, control on the models, if people doing other studies and they want to use our model, Maybe we can do something like a, a one place where we can the mathematics be standardized so you don't have different versions. But the whole idea is you use the software and uh, you run this process. Now, of course, if you have uh, um, access to a CT and, and um, I think a medical examiner or we have access to a CT, I assume. Right? <laughs> good assumption. <laughs> access to a phantom, <laughs> good assumption. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, you can use a laser scanner. Uh, is, that's even worse. <laughs> You've seen our budget. Okay. If you don't have, you can use a digitizer and scan the points. The digitizer, like, you scan them as much as you can. There are so many possibilities of using it. To the training, you need CT. You need the CT scan. Yes, yeah, I'm not talking about the user. The user. You can use it. Yeah. Can you use any input? Okay. So data that's useful to you is DICOM CT. Yes. The data that we can use, we can use anything. To control our model, right. we need the CT to yeah. get the skin depth. Okay. And the, the, yeah, the more skin depth knowledge, the better we have. I will I'll show you in the lab how like, the two modes add in. So if you have. Uh, someone that is, you know, you have a decedent there you're working mm. on, can you get, can you scan it with, um, and you said you prefer them, did you keep them in a horizontal position because of the gravity you said was pulling? What if you have a, a decedent that you want to give that information, like a Guatemalan or something like that? Well, in the CT scan position, that's called the supine position. That's the, the clinical, position. that's what the spine position on the table. Uh, but it, you could literally, you don't have to scan the skull in this position. If you have a skull only, you can put it in a different position. You can put it, it won't matter if you don't have skin. No, so I'm yeah. saying if you have skin. If, if you, you have, have skin, skin and the full body, you mean? I don't know how you can uh, change the table in the CT to have sitting position. It's very, you can, yeah, if you have to have a supine position, yeah. But you can rotate it. You can, you can have, instead of supine position, the the, you can put the subject on sagittal. I mean, you, you could do that basically with some, some sort of a fix on the table. Uh, there are more, yeah. Actually, it can be a parameter that's added to the model. We can even try this data sagging the gravity. Uh, it's yeah, like the put a, a parameter in the model, the position of the patient, and see how this can. It could be, that, that's the beauty of the kernel model. But I'll tell you, the more the, more the patient is, is big, that, that effect goes, but the thinner people, it, it mm -hmm. matters. And uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania has a CT scan um, study, I guess, and they have about 1,500 CT scans that you can request. That's very nice. To yeah. include, and yeah. all you have to do is tell them about your study, because mm -hmm. I've requested I use CT scans on mm -hmm. Ibiza as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you can, and they have all different ancestries. They're historical mm -hmm. cases, but they're all scanned, and they know they have, they have known, no soft tissue, mm -hmm. just skulls that they have mm -hmm. scanned. But they are known ancestry. Some of them have ages, and they're from all over the world.
that that would be uh, good for the ancestral. Uh, uh, but, and they're but, available yeah. for researchers, so you can write and they'll send you the CDs. Excellent. But they may, uh, what we need is the live patients for the for soft tissue. I also have ultrasound. I've seen some people did ultrasound. Mm -hmm. uh, the ultrasound, I, I, I'm over also ultrasound lab. I have a lot of work with ultrasound. The, the problem but with the ultrasound is you can't just, you, you can bother the people by asking this because you will have to put uh, gel and then oh, pick okay. select it. But you can, we can do with ultrasound is basically get selected uh, uh, areas. But CT, the beauty of CT or MRI that you can get the entire, with MRI is a little bit tricky because, because the, the, uh, the segmentation of MRI is, is not as easy as, uh, as CT. But the more soft tissue information you have with different demographics, mm -hmm. uh, the bone by itself will work fine, at least on the getting, uh, solidifying the landmarks but the soft tissues is the, for the prediction model. So uh, I, I think uh, if in the future we would like to have this expanded software, so you could add multiple scenarios and you see it on this, and you could select the scenario you want. It will not eliminate the forensic artist, but, but it, it, it helps the forensic artist doing his, his or her job better. But also we could help the forensic artist, in, in, and that's what we're proposing this to, is to do some rendering and the software, 3D rendering, like they do, and could be a clue for them. That's our prediction from the software. C can you reproduce? But we don't want to influence the process too, so we have we have to be careful about that. You have a portable CAT scan. I guarantee if you take it to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences meeting, set it up with the release form, mm -hmm. you're going to have a line out the door of people. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. there, there, there are portable the ones. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. There are portable ones, they call them CT fluoroscopy, yes. which, which basically does the same thing like, uh, actually, but I'm not sure how you do it on the, on the skull, but there are some portable uh, CT machines. It could be this interesting idea. Yeah, I was say, <laughs> you see what your skull looks like, and I guarantee everybody there will get very IRB, the problem with the IRB, live patients you have. If I want to do it, the school would tell me that I have, I have to go through an IRB process. Uh, the yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this one, because the IRB, we still had IRB here, but this, like patients already, we didn't change their scan, so they were scheduled for scan, so we just collected their yeah. scan, all yeah, they, yeah, without, without known identifiers. Yeah. Okay. Any ideas? Now I'm asking for ideas. <laughs> Any more ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, th this is fascinating work, and uh, we, we would, li would like to have this actually really seen it implemented. Uh, I'm very interested to make sure that this table is updated all the time and find the right groups actually to share this with, because this is, I think this is ongoing work can go for years. So. Have you shared it with Karen Taylor? Just the, the tables. Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet. I, I know she's a very busy woman, if I can get hold of her. No, I, maybe, yeah, we will yeah. certainly, yeah. Sure, um, we'll, what was actually in my mind, but I, I didn't know how to contact her, but that, that's, yeah, she, we, we used this, some of her tables, yeah. Are, are there tables used in plastic surgery? No, plastic surgery completely different. Uh, I, I don't think they use these tables in plastic surgery. Uh, and plastic surgery, there also a lot of subjectivity into it. Because in plastic surgery, he doesn't have to rely on soft, soft tissue thickness. He will do it, I mean, he, the surgeon himself. There's a, a, a plastic surgeon, uh, or not plastic surgeon, uh, one coming from Vanderbilt to meet me the 8th of August. He wants to use uh, uh, reconstructive in the mandible, but he, the difference also, not only the soft tissues, he wants to see the mechanical because he works not, not to make people look good, but he has some cases where the mandible is destroyed and he needs to construct biomechanically too. So not only appearance, but appearance and biomechanics and see the strength. Uh, I don't think they rely on tables because they do their own. So how do you like your face to be? Probably they, they, they will do it. I mean, <laughs> no, sci no, no, no scientific data here. It's, uh, it's what you want. <laughs> Sex determination. 
Uh, yes, we hope that that's the other. If we merge the two gra grants, the one that we're doing right now is, uh, I put some of the results with sexing from uh, knowing the 98% the Karenia. Uh, yes, certainly that will be in the in the atlas that Imam is talking about, the underlying one. If we have uh, uh, females uh, and we have their uh, soft tissue thickness, we'll definitely cover because these values will vary for, from from a man to a woman. I mean, definitely. Yeah, I mean that that what in the in the other proposal we suggested having a larger percentage of the population females because this were all, all, all men here. Mm. You're gonna put us out of business. No, no. <laughs> helping, helping completely. <laughs> we're helping here. We're we're still engineers, so we <laughs> no. We're the, the whole idea is to to uh, becoming an a, a, another another way of looking or helping the uh, examiner or helping identification will allowing another scenario not just just one subjective scenario that's introducing a little bit of science into the process that's that's all well, it's three dimensional with the clay the skull is in there mm -hmm. so you're without that skull for a period of time you want to do anything else with it or absolutely yeah you could run multiple scenarios and and even before you start the click, the, the artist or the expert could play with the software a little bit and, and run different scenarios, the one of them like fat or thin or, or on something in between.